Welcome, everybody. Thank you. I'm glad to see you. It, I, I was a lot younger, a lot younger. I was practicing law in Hartsville, South Carolina on a beautiful day, as I remember it. And this is before internet, like, like we have it now. I had dial-up on my law firm desk. And so I had AOL.com, and you'd have to, I can't remember how to get on, we would click it. You want me to make that noise for you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I was the first big story I ever remember looking up on the internet, and that a plane had hit the World Trade Center. And I was in there with my staff, and we looked at it and said, ah, it's just a plane, lots of planes in New York. We kept watching it, and sooner or later, you know, we started to realize what had happened. But for those of you who um, didn't live through it, it's been, an, it's been an event that's defined our time since then. And so, Dr. Hong and these professors have dedicated this week to helping you begin to process it and understand it, much like I had to do with Vietnam, Korea, World War II, as I was growing up. So, I'm thankful you're here, I'm thankful that you're interested in it. And before I go much further, I want to introduce, for those of you who are freshmen and even maybe sophomores, President Dan Lunsford and Barry Lunsford, who were President and First Lady before I got here, are here to support you tonight. And I want to, we all wave. <laughs> they are still very active in the community that live here in Mars Hill. They come to a lot of sporting events and they come to things like this and we appreciate y'all supporting us. And they also support a lot of scholarships. So thank you for that. Um, part of being in a liberal arts university is you get exposed to a lot of things. You get exposed to things you've never heard about. You get exposed to things that tick you off. You get exposed to things you agree with. You come across some professors you think are crazy or are way off. <laughs> you come across professors you fall in love with and you think just like them. But a, a liberal arts university is built to provoke your thought and to teach you how to think for yourself. And so, I, I'm so excited that you get to do that. Tonight, I think you'll hear some spirited discussion, and I guarantee you these four people do not think alike, and they do not see the world the same way. And that's okay. And in our world that we're living in right now, it doesn't seem okay to express yourself and then 50,000 people on Twitter condemn your point of view. We all have grown up differently in different communities, going to different events, some going to church, not, some not going to church, some going to athletics, some not in athletics. And you can go through that. We look differently. We have different accents. But y'all, tonight, we're all Mars Hill Lions. And my goal, our goal for you is to get to hear whatever takes place tonight. And that you learn and you begin to really understand these events and think for yourself and hopefully read and study on your own and develop your own point of view about it. So I've probably gone longer than you wanted, but I wanted you to, to know that these people are here that dedicated their lives to helping you have experiences like this. And I'm proud of you for coming tonight and, and the PAWS program. I'm very excited about that as you have to do this 42 times before you graduate. <laughs> but I see some other faculty. I see Dean Pierce and other faculty here. And Lisa, thank you. And, for those of you up there, thank you for being here and supporting this. So I'll get out of the way and have a good debate. Uh, tonight's 
9-11 commemoration brings back a lot of vivid images from that traumatic day 20 years ago when Islamist extremists known as Al-Qaeda, based in Afghanistan, murdered nearly 3,000 civilians on U.S. soil. Let us also remember the 412 emergency workers who died responding to the World Trade Center tragedy, as well as those who continue to suffer from residual health problems. I use the term Islamist extremist to describe Al-Qaeda. Initially, as Americans um, tried to make sense of Al-Qaeda's motives, there was talk of a clash of civilizations between Islam and Christianity. President George W. Bush correctly rejected this knee-jerk reaction. Six days after 9-11, the president visited a mosque in Washington, D.C., saying the attack, about the attack, this is not what Islam is all about. Indeed, rather than a clash between Islam and Christianity, Al-Qaeda's vicious attack represented a clash between a radical interpretation of Islam and America's founding ideals. The bipartisan 9-11 Com Commission Report of 2004 mentioned this ideological clash only briefly. Its main focus was to understand what happened and how it happened. Beyond the Commission, however, scholars around the world rushed to make sense of groups like Al-Qaeda and uh, militants like Osama bin Laden. Uh, a prominent revelation coming out of this work was that many Arab men coming of age in the 1970s and 1980s, including bin Laden, had become enamored with a radical Islamist uh, teaching and political religious movement that has come to be known as Salafi Jihadism. Salafi Jihadism. Salafists, very put simply, very simply, Salafists claim to practice a true, pure form of Islam with a rather severe interpretation of uh, Islamic law, Sharia, and a literal reading of the Quran. I guess it's most, uh, the closest American um, parallel lexicon would be fundamentalist. Jihadism refers to a violent rendering of a Muslim tradition of spiritual struggle, whereby in this case, armed struggle is justified to achieve Salafist uh, goals. The Salafist, uh, Salafi Jihadist worldview is grounded in dogmatic certainty, decreed from above, often fueled by conspiracy theories and historical distortions. Now, contrast that with America's founding ideals, ideals from the European Enlightenment with their emphasis on rationalism and intellectual freedom, on secularism and religious tolerance or separation of state from official religion with protection for personal beliefs, on democracy, or self-government emanating from the expressed will of the governed. The social order here then rests on a vigorous sifting and winnowing of, of evidence with the aim of attaining an approximation of truth. There's room to doubt, free to, free to inquire. In other words, the foundation and aspiration of a Mars Hill liberal arts education. So it's not hard to see the incompatibility here between Salafi jihadist um, ideals and enlightenment values Get rid of that, I'm not gonna have any more slides. The course to their collision, however, was a winding one, which some of our other folks here recall, but we need to recall that many young Arab jihadists rushed to Afghanistan in the 1980s to join a diverse coalition of Muslims fighting America's arch enemy at the time, the Soviet Union. The jihad in Afghanistan was a radicalizing accelerator for a lot of these fighters. So too was the Gulf War of 1990 and 1991 when tens of thousands of foreign troops, mostly American troops, flooded the Middle East in proximity to Muslim holy sites. In the wake of these events, Afghanistan, the Gulf War, Salafi jihadists dispersed to many countries with the goal of igniting a global jihad. Osama bin Laden, son of a billionaire from Saudi Arabia, was one of them. Bin Laden first settled in Sudan and then moved Al-Qaeda's headquarters to Afghanistan where a Salafi, uh, Salafist extremist group, the Taliban, had seized power. From there, Bin Laden declared it a duty for Muslims to kill Americans and their allies wherever possible. He called it a fatwa. Islamist scholars would say he is not in a position to call that sort of thing, especially in this vein. Al-Qaeda bombed U.S. embassies in East Africa in 1998. 
and the USS Cole in Yemen in 2000. And then came 9-11. At the outset, President Bush gave the Taliban an ultimatum. Hand over bin Laden and Al-Qaeda leaders or join in Al-Qaeda's fate. In less than three months, by December 2001, the Taliban was crushed and Al-Qaeda's infrastructure in Afghanistan was destroyed. Power vacuum. This power vacuum, however, also dictated that some kind of nation building was necessary to thwart the Taliban's return. 20 years later, after $2 trillion in the lives of more than 2,500 U.S. service members and 50,000 Afghan civilians, the Salafi-oriented Taliban has returned. Uh, as Americans grapple with what went wrong in Afghanistan, any analysis of 9-11 and its aftermath unavoidably traces back to the problem and challenges of ideological extremism. The 9-11 attack resulted from extremism of the Salafi jihadist movement in Islam. And U.S. nation building in Afghanistan, for good or worse, was guided by the goal of preventing a return of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and their radical ideologies. Therefore, it was no surprise, if culturally myopic, that the U.S. administrations and aid agencies in Afghanistan sought to instill the ideals and institutions of a free society, including self-government, religious and ethnic tolerance, and education and new opportunities for women. As I, as I reflected on these things over the past week, on the trauma of 9-11, the nature and threat of ideological extremism and the revolutionary impact of the European Enlightenment, I was reminded of, reminded of a troubling reality, one that warrants fuller discussion. And it is this. As we face the ongoing threat of extremist groups from abroad, we must also come to terms with threats to the Republic by extremists on our own shores. For in the very anniversary year of 9-11, and after 20 years in Afghanistan, during which thousands of American troops put their lives on the line, and State Department officials and aid workers sought to spread democratic values, American extremists struck at the heart of our democracy. They struck with dogmatic certainty, fueled by conspiracy theories, and incited from above by a standing president. On January 6th of this year, we watched as a violent mob tried to overturn a fair and accurate election and disrupt a sacred democratic institution, the peaceful transfer of power. In other words, we witnessed an attack on America's core values, an evidence-based empirical truth. Our country has transferred power peacefully for 240 plus years. But in 2020, a defeated president not only refused to concede, he lied repeatedly that the election had been rigged. In 240 plus years, not a single presidential election has suffered any meaningful fraud among those allowed to vote. But suddenly, according to President Trump, in 2020, for the first time ever, it happened. And tens of millions of Americans continue to believe this shameful lie, which means we're in a continuing crisis. For our young adults in the audience tonight, please know, none of this is normal. A president lying about election results is not normal. A president inciting mob violence is not normal. A political life where conspiracy theories override evidence-based reality is not normal, and these abnormalities must not become normalized. Our Republic, this fragile experiment of the Enlightenment, can only stand so many body blows to its core values and institutions. Repeated lies degrade trust in the system, and once trust goes, all bets are off. We're then on the slippery slope to democratic breakdown. This means, regardless of one's party, regardless of how one's, one voted, and that's very important, 
regardless of one's party, regardless of how one voted, our system of self-government depends more than ever on us being brutally honest, brutally honest with fact-based evidence. Courage is typically associated with difficult physical acts, and yet intellectual courage, the courage to face unpleasant facts and ambiguity is also hard. It is why the Enlightenment philosopher Immanuel Kant phrased learning as a daunting challenge. Dare to know, he said. Dare to know. So I ask you, as we continue to face lies and conspiracy theories and even violence, as we confront extremism from abroad and at home, dare to know the truth. Do the required intellectual work and do not lose faith in our unique constitution and democratic system. Thank you. security failures. What did we do? What analysis did we miss? What did we think we knew and we did know and we chose not to share it with, our, with other people? But let's make one thing clear before I get started. I served six years in the, in the best army in the world. I spent six years of my life there. I love this country. I support this country. I support any sitting president. We got to make some changes though. You understand where I'm coming from? Because I'm going to say some things that are unpleasant. Let's look at slide two, good sir. Yeah. <clears throat> two. Oh, there's, there's two. Bless your heart. I thought I was on dial up for a minute. Okay. <laughs> KSM, and if I pronounce, mispronounce somebody's name, I don't want to hear it. I just don't want to hear it, okay? Because I'm going to. I'm Southern. I'm going to mispronounce the name. I don't want to hear it, okay? Done. All right. The, the first slide is talking about an aspect of 9-11. The planner for the attack, Khalid Muhammad, KSM here on out, KSM, came to the U.S. and obtained a degree at a very nice institution in engineering. He understood the visa process. He understood that you could carry a box cutter and knives on the planes because he did it multiple times and never got caught. The one time one of his people did get caught, all of it was confiscated. He knew how weak we were at the airport. While planning it, he knew that our airline security was more about saving money as it is now. He's still in Guantanamo. He had a hearing yesterday. Yesterday! Okay. He has confessed. But this is on a military tribunal system. It is not, it's not in like any type of law or understanding that you know. UCMJ is a different world. Key takeaway. He knew we were weak. Needed a warrant to get information. He played that against us. He knew that we didn't talk well with one another, the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, National Security Administration. I will spend most of my time there. We did not communicate well. We still don't communicate as well as we need to. And that's, that's one of the tragedies that went on during this, this thing from there. Slide three, please, good sir. FBI plays man on man. The CIA plays a zone. Prior to 9-11, each FBI field office was responsible for opening up their own investigations. And when they did, they didn't share it. If I was in the FBI in Miami and I opened up a file on a mafia man who had a brother in Denver, I wasn't sharing it with the FBI office in Denver. You understand where I'm going with this? We didn't share the basic information to keep us safe and it comes down to ego. The irony of this is the FBI had opened seven files on 19 of the hijackers already. 
and not share the information. Some have stopped suspicious activity that he shared with local law enforcement. They had no clue. Some people had gone to flight schools and have been reported to the FBI as being suspicious. Amber Riddle in Daytona Beach, Florida, one went down there and says, I need to learn how to take off. Not as much interested in how to land. This was reported to the FBI and not shared. Number linked together as plotters. They had information, could share it. And here's the other thing. Airlines were responsible for their own security. By FAA rules, it was very inconsistent, unreliable. We had what we call a red hat team by the FAA. They would go in and check out the security in our airports. They got through all the time. It was so bad that the FAA got rid of the Red Hat teams because they were being embarrassed so much. They did nothing to change that process. They just quit doing it. Procedures were inadequate, inconsistent, unreliable and uncoordinated, usually by untrained, poorly supervised minimum wage workers. I'm not making fun of the minimum wage workers. I'm just saying you get what you pay for sometimes at that level. NSA can target foreign communications, but not inside America prior to 9-11. You understand what I'm saying? KSM told the people when they got over on their visas to go to Walmart, Wally's World, and get those phone cards, those phones, and they did. We couldn't track them. You said, well, we didn't want to. Did we not? That's your opinion. I'm giving you facts. So when can we go further? They pick up something overseas, a call about a wedding between KSM and Osama, about an upcoming wedding. And then it came in from Muhammad Atta, and I'm sure I butchered the man's name, the lead attacker. And he said, a lollipop and two sticks is when it's going to occur. A lollipop and two sticks, 9-11. We knew this. We knew this! But NSA shared this only with the CIA. And the CIA shared it with, with President Bush on the 10th in their daily briefing and said, the United States will be a victim to a massive airline attack on September 11th. They just didn't know where and when. Information was not put together as a puzzle. CIA had a big picture. The FBI had a lot of loose threats. They couldn't put them together. One, because they couldn't even share with one another. Slide four, please, good sir. For the FBI and law enforcement in general, investigative information can't be shared because it's very confidential, right? We have people in deep cover all over this world. We don't need to call their name out, right? Dan Lunsford is somewhere so-and-so. He's a dead man. You follow me? You can't share it. So what they did share it with was not, none of them, but did not share it with the non-law enforcement CIA officers, only the ones that are deep in there because it's top secret information. When we, when we deprive, when we, when we get information that is done by humans, meaning undercover work, that is shared very infrequently. And you, you, can, you can imagine why, right? Need to know. The CIA did not want to pass on the information they had because they couldn't act on it. And the FBI can't act overseas. So if I can't have the basketball and play with it, neither can you. They sit on it. Private airline security's got nothing. Local law enforcement got nothing. We pulled over several of the hijackers for violations prior to this. They didn't know, because there was no list. U.S. military, intelligence, and law enforcement communities were cumbersome, restricted by arcane security rules, trying to play by different rules, and we, and we paid the price. May I have slide five, please, good sir? Pre-9-11, the CIA collected intelligence, performed operations within distinctive geographic regions by the, by the Department of State. 
East Division, Near East Division, Latin America, so on and so forth. However, anything working overseas was not well funded. If it was global, we didn't fund it well. Are you serious? Here's why. We didn't expect for it to come here and get us. We thought we had it under control. We were following people correctly. We were not. CIA had a very good picture overall. We knew Bin Laden. Dr. Gribbon did a great uh, way of, of going into there. We knew him well trying to get Russia out of Afghanistan, correct? Yes. We knew that Al Qaeda had bombed the embassies in both Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, and the USS Cole in Yemen. We knew this. But the covert action authority given by the president, only by the president of the United States, for CIA to take care of operatives overseas, had not, had not been authorized. That's where it comes from, not Congress. Now pay attention to me as we go come back up with that, because that's a very dangerous statement I just made. Do you understand what I'm saying? The CIA only answers to the president of the United States of America. And when that covert action is given, the gloves are off. I'll explain it to you in just a minute. They did say, though, the CIA counterterrorism said to the Director of Central Intelligence, to George Tenet, brief President Bush, all the lights are blinking, which means we have enough information to know we're going to get hit. But they didn't know where. They didn't know, they were, they didn't know the hijackers were already in the United States of America, ready to go. They already had their plans made how they were going to go and what their targets were. Swallow that just for a minute. The best intelligence agency in the world did not know because we didn't share the names. They also had no idea that the planes themselves would be the weapons. They took planes from the East Coast bound, bound for California. And if you could sit through those two movies that Dr. Hahn put on, they were great. But God, that was hard on my depression medication. Mm -hmm. They took planes bound for California because they had more jet fuel on it. Well, if they knew that, why didn't we? Why didn't we? We're not paying attention to that. That's not a hard draw, is it? Remember my first comment. I love the country. I'm just, I'm just being, I'm just giving you the facts from my opinion. Slide six, good sir. Like all previous Al Qaeda attacks, CIA believed, CIA believed it would happen overseas, not in the United States of America. Not on my back door. No info shared. In addition to FBI not highlighting their presence in the U.S. to the CIA, there was no screening mechanism available for the airlines to see when people were coming and going that were shared. Even now, that's a false security. Political will. The Clinton administration was very concerned about the potential collateral civilian deaths. Now, this makes you uncomfortable. Good. When I say collateral civilian deaths, I mean just that. If we have a target to take out and five or six other people have to be around it, swing low. You're done. Cold or fat? Fat. Bush was distracted, and he wanted a military act, not a CIA. Remember, the military has to follow by rules by Congress. CIA, if the president gives them the green light, no rules. No major rules. You follow me? No federal agency has, or judicial courts, have any, any review of their actions overseas. Do you understand the words coming out of my mouth? Okay. Here is my summation. There was a failure in imagination using planes as weapons inside the United States. We did not phantom this to happen. Two, there was no structure, no way to track people in here. Thousands of flights coming and going, over 900 major airports. That's a huge enigma. There was a failure of leadership, making the hard call. Are we in it or not? Are we going to take out the target or not? And I'm listening, that's hard. I know we're liberal arts people. I'm a man of God. That's a, that's a tough question, isn't it? Are you in it? 
or are we not? As the president says, we have different opinions. I'm just saying. Are we in it or are we not? Are we going to handle it or are we, are we, going, to, we going to hold it in kitty gloves? I didn't give you an answer. I gave you a question. And lack of information. Gross lack of information. There was a fourth plane, and I still can't get over that one that Dr. Hahn showed us. That fourth plane. Oh, my God. Do you know what happened? Where did, where did it crash? Well, bless your heart. Do you know that we scrambled F-14s and F-15s to go take it out because the president said that we could? Do you, wait a minute, that's not the deal. We gave them the wrong grid. They went 150 miles out in the Atlantic Ocean because we gave them the wrong where the plane was. We couldn't get that right. This is the best military in the world. And we couldn't get it right. If I don't make you feel just a little bit, moving around a little bit, check your pulse. <laughs> Let's look a little bit here. Slide seven, please, sir. So now a requirement that FBI agents receive intelligence collection training, and we now share it because we now have a, a national security intelligence community director. Well, as long as we got a director at the federal level, it's going to be shared. Just like FEMA made it to, to the, the, the uh, hurricane stuff years and years ago. We had people dying on bridges. They were locked up in jails for 30 days because we, we forgot about them. Don't you tell me how exit we can be by the federal government getting to things on time. Do your research, history on that. Prove me wrong on that, please. We now have author authorized the covert action for the president. Vice President Cheney says we're taking the gloves off. They now have authority, CIA does, to locate and eliminate the target. Use it by drone. Did we use drones just the other day? We most certainly did. We're using drones right now. You say no. You don't know. You don't know that. The SEAL team may be slipping off right now somewhere that you don't, you don't have any clue. Right now, slipping off in that water. You hear them? I hear them getting in the water. They're going for a target. You'll never know. You say, do you need to know? That's a conversation that I can't have with these people right here. Okay? <laughs> All right? Under Title 50, you know, I say it's code. This can happen. We do this very, very well. Maybe, maybe we should look at it now. Maybe, maybe you can't run as well as you used to. Maybe you can't hide like you used to be able to. NSA has been unleashed. And that's a little scary for me with the Patriot Act. And I don't have time for the Patriot Act. I mean, it is long. But in essence, NSA now has an easier time tapping information if they think it's a terrorist. Matter of fact, if they want your records, if a federal Homeland Security investigator wants your records here, they can get it without a search warrant. I'm sorry, did, what, did you hear what I just said? <laughs> Prove me wrong. <clears throat> Games changed. Collateral damage is now acceptable if the president says so. Collateral damage is now acceptable if the president says so. Let that ring, let that ring in. Let that ring in. Slide eight, good sir. You're doing a great job too. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not watching you, sir. You're, you're, a, you're a large seal person. I figured you got me going. Sure, looks good to me. Slide eight. Come on, Vanna. Okay. When you, what you have didn't work, you start over. We created the Department of Homeland Security. 33 different departments now report to them. That's a glom. Supposed to work really well. And it probably does a little bit. Costs us billions of dollars. I'm not saying we don't need it. I'm pro-military. The better Air Force we got, the better we're going to have freedom. Now, you don't have to agree with me, don't care. That's me. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. TSA is supposed to work. Really? Who's on the watch list besides me? Who's, who's, who's on the, who's on, are you, I, I put you on the list too, Dr. Hunt. 
I got a metal knee. Since I set the machine off twice, I'm on the list. I can't get on an airplane without being patted down. I think they like me a lot. Okay. We've moved on from there. Try to make a little bit of humor because this is, this is a hard subject for me. The jury remains out. We'll see. Our 20 year anniversary is coming up, right? And guess what some of our best animals are saying right now? They're saying the lights are beginning to blink just a little bit. Just a little bit. For the anniversary. Are we sharing? Are we taking care of business? Are we taking, are we looking to see where we are? We are better. We do share it with local law enforcement. TSA has a direct line. All those things are going. I'm not saying we're not trying. But we've got to be careful. What you've got to ask yourself is, are you okay with uh, Title 50, United States Code Covert Action Authority to eliminate terrorist acts that your government says is a terrorist? Are you okay? We send the people over there that are going to eliminate the target. Now that's that's politician where we're going to kill you. Eliminate the target. <laughs> Means we're going to kill you. And if your mom and your sons are there with you, who cares? You're the target. You're coming out. Are you ready? Are we, are, we, are, we, are we ready to do that? Are we going to have to do that? Who makes that decision right now? It's the President of the United States of America. Y'all better, better, better pay attention. Because my generation has blown this. Y'all gonna have to fix it. Oh yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> the FBI wants to prosecute within the judicial system. CIA wants to eliminate the target. The president has to make a choice. Which one's he gonna do? We know in closing. We talk a lot about these foreign terrorists. Our worst terrorist right now we have is a white male with military training in the United States of America. You ain't got to like me about that. You don't got to send me a Christmas card. I'm just telling you it's the truth. Understood? We got to be careful where we're going. Am I doing on time, Dr. Hahn? Am I still all right? Okay. In closing, you always like when the preacher says that they're always lying, by the way. They always got two or three other things left. In closing, America is an open country. The door's wide open. So don't be surprised if somebody comes in. I think that's okay. We're a country of immigrants. Did I upset you? You're, you're breathing heavy. My Republican friend took a deep breath. I've upset him. Okay. okay. Comes in. My point is, don't be surprised. We know people come in, right? Yeah, yeah. We work under something called a social contract. And for my students, if you don't know that, I hate you and I hate me. <laughs> Hard to please it. America is still the target. In 2000, 50% of all the terrorist targets was the United States of America. Their assets. Because we're at the top of the flagpole. And when you climb to the top of the flagpole, there ain't one part of your body showing and people take shots at it. You understand what I'm saying? And do we, have we, have we pissed some people? So that's not appropriate word for the president, about the other president being here. Have we agitated other people in the past to do that maybe? Yes! It cost us billions of dollars to do this war. Are we winning? Are we winning? I don't know. Can we stop? I don't know. But don't, don't send me something in the mail saying you want to close a military base. We're no longer friends. So we got we to reduce it. Yeah, you, you, not to have another solution. And I'm a lifelong Democrat. He's going to hit me in the back of the head. I understand that. Yeah, he, he can't stand this close to a Democrat without me rubbing off on him. I understand. <laughs> let, me get, let, me close, let me give you something positive to close with. You ready? Yep. Say yes. yes. If you knew how many plots our intelligence community keeps from happening in the United States of America, you give them a round of applause. There are water plants, nuclear plants, all kind of stuff that they saw, but they can't put it on TV! Because the idiots will get out there and explain how they broke and did it. It's freedom. Baloney! You can't show your vulnerability all over the world to copycats and expect them not come to get you. That's second grade logic. 
Anybody got anybody in their, in their family is in the United States Navy, the best Navy in the world? Anybody got a, a friend or a family? When you're on that ship, you can't tell where, that, where you're on that ship at. Why? Why do you think that is? Why can't you tell? Conjecture. Huh? Could you guess? Um, you want to help me? Yes. And why would that be good, sir? Why would that be? You're right. Why would that be? You're one of my students, right? Of course you are. Okay. <laughs> Keep in mind, we're better than we say we are. We, are, we do a lot of good work. What I did in my responsibility tonight was to show the vulnerabilities. I did that. Does it make you angry? Good. Does it mean we need to be careful? Yes. We have to be careful how we go forward. Absolutely. Can we sit on our butt and let it go away? It's not going away. They're coming to us. God bless you. I tell you what, the, the rhetoric of these last two people are, is pretty high. I think there's going to be another round of applause. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. It's great to see you, and I hope that I provoke a lot of questions in you as we move towards our Q&A time. Well, Americans watched in horror on 2000, in 2001 on uh, September 11th, a day that left nearly 3,000 Americans dead in New York City, Washington, D.C., and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. But last week, Americans watched again in sorrow as the nation's military mission in Afghanistan, our longest war ever, uh, come to a bloody and very chaotic and most inconclusive conclu uh, conclusion. Next, please. The enduring power of the 9-11 attacks is clear. <clears throat> First of all, I was just about 100 feet away when I learned. I was walking down the crossroads and people were talking, and then in crossroads it was actually talked about, and that's how I learned. Right after that, I had a church history class up in Cornwell, and I said, this is going to change history. And one young fellow, actually older fellow, who just been out of the military a few weeks, said, hell, professor, this is going to change religious history. And that's kind of what I'm here to talk about. Because as this country comes to grips with the tumultuous exit of United States military forces from Afghanistan, the departure has raised long-term questions about US foreign policy and America's place in the world. And after a war that cost thousands of lives, more than 2,000 American service members, and trillions of dollars of military spending, a new Pew Research survey finds that 69% of U.S. adults say that the United States has mostly failed to achieve its goals in Afghanistan. Hashtag legacy. Next one. Abraham is a spiritual forefather of Judaism, 15th century before common era or BC, Christianity, and Islam. And the words for God in Hebrew and in Arabic are similar. Elohim, Allah, eh, has the A ah sound, the L sound, the H sound. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, loved the Jewish monotheism, just loved it because he thought that this Jewish monotheism model would be a good way that he could start to unify the disunified tribes in Saudi Arabia. And to this day, contests arise whether the gods of these three faiths are the same or entirely different. I can go into most churches around this area and talk about this, this and if I talk about the same God of Christianity and Islam and Judaism, I'll get a lot of pushback. Say that the Muslim God is not the same as the Christian God. But these contests will always ramp up the spiritual temperature in interfaith relationships. So, and now to the build up to 9 11. It has a spiritual dimension. Next, please. Contests like the Crusades are long remembered by the Muslims. For 300 years, 300 years or three centuries, 
European nations sent crusade after crusade into Muslim areas to rout, to kill, to maim, uh, and to try to take over the, the Holy Land. That's a whole semester in one sentence. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> That's and the, I'd like to use the Israeli-Palestine 1949 to present as a model for how terrorism started becoming a, I guess, a, a international policy of people like Al-Qaeda. In 1949, you had the formation of Israel out of Palestinian land. And of course, the Palestinians have never forgiven this. This has led to conflict with Muslims and Jews opposed, but the latter, the Jews, always had these significant factors in the United States, a.k.a. Christians, because they, they, the Christians will find support in their Bibles that somehow Jerusalem is supposed to be uh, taken care of by Christians because it's the place where the end times are going to be, and so you don't mess with the Jews. But in the meantime, radical Palestinians took advantage of modern communications, transportation systems, to start to internationalize their struggle. They launched a series of hijackings, kidnappings, bombings, shootings, culminating in the kidnap, kidnapping and the deaths of Israeli athletes during the 1972 Munich Olympics. These Palestinian groups became a model for numerous militants and offered lessons for subsequent groups like Al-Qaeda and, and to, to, to offer how to, how to do things, how to commit uh, terrorism. Palestinians therefore created an extensive international extremist network, probably for the very first time that that happened. It was tied into various state sponsors of terrorism, like Soviet Union, certain Arab states, as well as certain, some criminal organizations. But by the night, end of the 1970s, Palestinian Secular Network has a major, is a major channel for the spread of terrorist techniques, terrorist technology, you might call it, around the world. We started noticing the United States in 1979 with the Iran hostage crisis. 444 days, it was, came at the very end of the Jimmy Carter administration. It ended on the day one of President Reagan. So it, it, it led to a failed presidency, if you want to call it that, of Jimmy Carter. So this is something that it, it caught our attention. Who are these Muslims? What, who are these Islamic extremists? We had to start finding this out. In 1993, the World Trade bombing. Did you all know there's a bombing in 1993? <clears throat> Six people were killed, thousands were wounded, or thousands were wounded, 50,000 people had to evacuate the Twin Towers. They brought home to America that there is this shocking and new reality of Islamic terrorism as a global phenomenon that is, that has, and probably will continue to impact the United States. The absolute scale of this, the planning, the implementation, uh, was only broken by some really bad planning on one particular part by the, by the uh, bombers. They, uh, they let, let it be known where they rented the van. So, and that, was, that helped them, had to help the FBI to find them. After 9-11 in the United States, the next Sunday after 9-11, 9-11 happened on a Tuesday, on that following Sunday, churches were packed. It was a very short-lived mass packing uh, after a few weeks, a few, uh, certainly after a few months, levels died down. But what happened was that, you did, that, that the Christians did not know what to do with their vulnerability or their anxiety as they went and practiced their faith and practiced their worship. They didn't have anything to do, anything to know what to do with it. The Christian churches at the time, I think, kind of failed America by not providing anything except comfort. They didn't provide analysis. They didn't provide anything more intellectual like we've been talking up here. It just provided more comfort. And the only time that they would say anything that would be meaningful to the, the congregants was something that might be violent as a strike back, as a way of supporting uh, military action and 
basically extremism to the Muslims in return for their extremism, extremism here. At the start of 2000, 38% of Americans thought, said there was absolute moral truths that never changed, but <clears throat> the same questions was asked two months after 9-11, and only 22% claimed that the existence of moral truths actually existed. So Americans after the 9-11 the are actually losing their faith in moral certitude. They're, we're becoming a nation of, we don't know what's, what's really going on. We're becoming a little bit uncertain. So post 9-11, we're in a more relativistic state about our bedrock beliefs. Yes. Women started attending church more often, about 8% after 9-11. Older folks like me and some people over here attended church. Uh, started attending church more by ten percent. Catholics also attended church by, by about ten percent more. But get this: atheists increased from three percent to ten percent in, in the two or three months. So that moral certitude is dying down. Conservative attitudes after 9/11. One quote, I just have to read it. We must be aware of the superiority of our civilization. This is an American speaking. A system that has guaranteed well-being, respect for human rights, and in contrast with Islamic countries, respect for religious and political rights. This resonates with President Bush's statement that the terrorist attack was an attack on civilization. And American Christianity began to, I think, write off Islamic societies saying that Western ideals such as liberal arts, freedom, conscience, and other liberties like speech, press, and religion, these make no sense in Islamic countries. They can't handle those truths. And so American Christians, I think, wrote off as that the, the, the Muslims were e ever going to be kind of bar barbaric compared to our self-imposed self-righteousness. Uh, and so we have this divide. And I think it's a spiritual divide. Next slide, please. So among US Muslims, widespread well, concern about their, play, our, about their place in American society. Discrimination? Yes, 75%. You feel Donald Trump makes you feel worried? Yes, 68%. Do American people see Islam as part of mainstream society? 62% said yes. I mean, so, excuse me, no. So, in recent years, being Muslim in the United States, has it gotten more difficult or has it changed much? 50% to 44 say it has gotten more difficult. And that's just data that's four years old. So, between 2001 and now, there's been some, well, the, the plight of Muslims in America has not really improved much at all. So we have the new normal. Some of you may not or may remember the, 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 the color code. It was laughable, yes, but it, it always reminds us that we always knew what it was. And it's sort of this, this constant background, you know, earworm that would say, you know, this is what's going on. Be careful, be careful. Most of the time it was, it was, it was orange, I believe. It's high risk of terrorist attacks. So imagine planning your day knowing that it's an orange world out there. <laughs> Next one. Oh, anyway, I know, keep going back. You're right to the very end. Oh, there you go. Oh, there you go. Oh. That's okay. So this is, you know, a little blatant, but it probably epitomizes some of the Christian understanding from the Barna Institution, a, a, a very conservative Christian think tank, they say after the attack, millions of nominally churched or generally irreli irreligious Americans were desperately seeking something that would restore stability and a sense of meaning to their lives. Many of them turned to the church. I say we went to church for comfort, not for asking the deep questions that you get in your liberal arts classes, like how do we now live as Christians, or how do we live as faithful people in a post 9-11 world? Those were never the questions. We were basically driven by the narratives of revenge, ever vigilant security, 
meeting extremism with, 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 with violent force. And so the Christians really never had a chance, I'd say, to get, to get anything other than a reactive, knee-jerk reaction against Islam. Christian leaders remarks. You got Franklin Graham, son of the Billy. Uh, Islam is an evil religion that preaches violence. Christian coalition Pat, Pat, Pat Robertson, also a presidential candidate back in the day. <clears throat> Muhammad is an absolute wild-eyed fanatic, a robber, a brigand, a killer. And Reverend Jerry Vines, former president of the Southern Baptist Convention, called Muhammad a demon-possessed pedophile. Sounds like, you know, not, not very good um, role models. So, when these folks make these kind of statements, says one Muslim scholar, they can please their constituents, and then they can say they're sorry, and they apparently think that's the end of it. But what happens is that these statements get tweeted all over the Muslim world and they lodge in the long-term memory of Muslims around the world. And Americans are not even cognizant of the serious long-term damage that these things can, can cause. So we in the United States learn to be terrified of things like jihad or Sharia law rather than, than just befriending Muslims. Views of Muslims became partisan. Conservative American Christians wrote off Islamic societies, saying that Western ideals make no sense in the Middle East. We believe there's no room in Islamic culture for freedom, democracy, which has been so allied with Christianity. We were now the freedom lovers, sorry about the Islamic world, allied with the Satan, the devil, so, so the Christian right had a free pass to paint Islam as an extremist, a failure, without due consideration of how Christians and Christianity in the past had been just as extremist, just as violent. Christians were never lured into asking the questions about the future of humanity as ever better than what existed in that day in America at that time. For the Christians, it was the best of all possible worlds. It could not be improved. They did not ask questions on how to make things better. As one United States soldier in Iraq said to a reporter when asked what scared, or why, what scared the Iraqi children, what should they be told? And he said, what, he said, what should they be told when they hear U.S. helicopters above, the, above their houses? And the soldier says, tell them it's the sound of freedom. As you would say, let that sink in. Let that sink in. Next. This is only 100 miles away. This sign went up 100 miles away. Catawba County. Such Christian attitudes were both fruit and also future seeds of future antagonism and continued violence against Muslim peoples. America's methods of trying to eradicate terrorism with war instead of understanding or goodwill efforts, that engaged other people around the world in ways that probably was not the best they could, but our, it was not our best time. It was not our best first foot forward. We could only fuse Christianity with the United States, the United States of America, with freedom, etc. But every time we saw Islam, we fused it with barbarism. And, and Muslims could not be anything better than barbarous. How did Islam change? I only have one slide for this. The, the, it's hard to, to do it country by country, but in general, U.S. Muslims, by every count, still have a lot of discrimination. But worldwide, what happened? The Muslims started doing intra-mosque and extra-mosque organizing. They created large, extensive networks to exchange resources, to bolster each other up, to support each other in the face of Western challenges or ignorance. 
these network, networks were inside the mosques, but when the mosque got too hot sometimes in some countries, they would join and be in community centers, or they'd join clubs or after school programs in order to have sort of below the radar uh, organizing activities. So they organize and they exchange information. They exchange money through banking systems, used in many different ways, sometimes to support terrorists, sometimes to support people who just wanted to go on the, on the pilgrimage. They supported, they, they exchanged political support across countries. They helped recruit, not only for educational purposes, but also maybe for extremist purposes. They organized for cultural enhancement, to teach people what it's meant, what it's like to have an Islamic culture or an Islamic education. They would support the Hajj, people going on the pilgrimage with money. <clears throat> And they supported a worldwide, basically a worldwide Islamic culture that would exist and coexist in many nations around the world. And this, this has paid off. And so you have a lot of, uh, of organized, organization by Muslims that's quite above board. Here's why you should be proud to be a Muslim. Here's what's good about being a Muslim. Yes, of course, the extremists come along for the ride. But it, so many people have been helped by this organization around the world. Characteristics associated with Westerners and Muslims. These are the traits associated with Westerners among Muslims in predominantly Muslim countries. They see us as selfish 68, violent 66, greedy 64, immoral 61, arrogant, fanatical, respectful of women 44, honest 33. Power, 31. Generous, 29. That's how we're viewed. I don't know whose fault that is. I'll let you decide that. <laughs> Conclusions. No, sorry. <laughs> this is scary. This one's scary. It's from the Pew Research. 2010, 2050. 2010, 2050. Two graphs. Right now, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, but by 2050, 2.76. Almost as many as the, the Christians in the world. Right now, there's 2.17. It's going up not as fast, but in, in 30 years, 29 years, there'll be almost the same number of Muslims and Christians. But look at this. Percent of the global population, Christians are still at 31.4 and will remain at 31.4. Okay, percent of the global population. But Muslims are going to go from 23.2 to 29.7 of the percentage of, of population. These, these projected changes. I'm not optimistic here because you can't weed out extremism. Extremists, extremist Al-Qaeda, ISIS kind of Islam is going to go up in with this. Especially if they see the United States as being opposed, not willing to understand, and meeting them only with force. So American Christianity failed to start seeing things. And so when you have folks that, start, that fail to start seeing Muslims as real people, that sort of seeps into the culture. And it gets, it gets bred in the bone. And it's really hard to root out. You can't root it out today, I don't think. So if we have Christians that are going to be becoming less of a majority in 29 years, seeing the threat of Muslims, do you think we're going to say, bring it on, let's have a party, let's have a fest, let's, let's love each other? I don't think so. Because the last 20 years has not been a great legacy of open arm, trying to understand each other. So, takeaway: extremism is not going to go away. The, demographic, the, the, the demographics seem very clear about that. So, in conclusion, Christians in the United States, especially, don't see a God in common with Muslims. And thus, they have not practiced very well seeking common ground. 
you mentioned Samuel Huntington. Did you? Yeah. His clash of civilizations idea, his thesis says that, that civilizations are bound to clash. And that has sort of taken it over in conservative and Christ, conservative Christian uh, communities. That, they're, that, that the civilizations of Christianity and the civilizations of Islam are not destined to meet in co on common ground, but are destined always to fight, destined to be competitive. And it's, it's not a very promising thesis, especially if you've got a lot of people of good faith in the United States believing that. I could be wrong about this, and I'd love to be shot out of the water here on this. So, when you have a system where you don't see equals, but only opponents, I don't have much hope for the future. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Dr. Heather Vaughn, and I'm going to stay out of the light. Um, thank you guys so much for coming, uh, especially the students that were here the past couple of nights. We shared a little, some little tears last night, and I appreciate y'all um, coming and listening to what we have to say today. So hopefully we'll give you a little bit more insight. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the war on terror. And I'm going to do it in 15 minutes. <laughs> um, this is so expansive. As I was putting this together over the past couple of weeks, you know, thinking about what I wanted to put in this, it, it, every sentence I'm going to say, guys, is a semester of graduate school. So, I mean, people are going to be studying this for a really long time. There's so many aspects of it that are really important. So uh, I, I apologize for whipping through it really fast, but I'm interested in any questions that you guys might have. So the first question I get a lot of students ask me is, Dr. Khan, where did we go wrong after 9-11? Where did we go wrong? I've been getting that a lot the past two weeks. Well, my answer has always been and continues to be, next slide, 72 hours after 9-11. That's where we went wrong. This is when uh, Congress passed the authorization for use of military force. And this isn't one of those long bills that takes hours to read. No, this is the body of it right here. And I'm going to read that to you. I underline the key parts. That the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines plan, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States. This was introduced 72 hours after 9-11. Look, look at the votes. This is why we focus on critical thinking here at Marcel. This is liberal arts education. There is, under no circumstances, should we have had a Senate vote of 98 to 0 giving the executive branch all of this enormous power. Under no circumstances. House voted 420 to 1. One Democrat, California, was the only person that said, I'm a little bit anxious about this. This was signed into law by the POTUS, by President George Bush, on September 18th. Seven days. One week. One week, that's it. Giving them a complete blank check. And you go, okay, well, all right. He went to Afghanistan and Iraq. Next slide. No. The war on terror, this is just 2018 to 2020. 85 different countries we have participated in military action, i.e., committed violence in 85 different countries under the AUMF. This does not include where we have military bases. This does not include where we sold arms to people to fight terrorists. This is where we actually committed acts of terrorism. It includes air and drone strikes, on the ground combat, Section 127E programs, which is some, uh, special forces go in and train, um, and uh, uh, military exercises in preparation for as, our, or as a part of counterterrorism missions. A 
Okay, so it doesn't include everything, but it includes a lot. And of course, there's a lot that is still top secret that has not been cleared for public information, so we don't know that this is completely exhaustive. And this should scare you. When we're talking about Biden withdrawing from Afghanistan, and you guys think that's significant? <laughs> okay, he's got 84 countries to go. All right? Do you understand what I'm saying? This idea that we're going to be pivoting to Asia, we're going to be pivoting to Russia, well, we got to draw down this first. How many tariffs are we creating with all of these military actions around the world? All right, this is what the AMF has got, AUMF has gotten us. So we started fighting in Afghanistan, to keep it right there, we started fighting in Afghanistan 26 days after 9-11. So President Bush got his AUMF, his blank check, 26 days later, we began bombing. Enduring Freedom, which was the Afghanistan war, part of the global war on terror, was actually doing really well at the beginning. Al-Qaeda was decimated. Uh, a little bit more than uh, two-thirds of Al-Qaeda was actually either killed or captured. So we really had uh, uh, them on the run. And the Taliban actually tried to negotiate with the US at this time. Hey, we'll turn over Osama bin Laden and we want to form some kind of coalition government with whatever you've got planned <laughs> with Hamid Karzai. Uh, and uh, Don Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense at the time, said absolutely no go. We are not going to do that. We want to destroy the Taliban. The Taliban, which destroyed the Soviet Union. We're going to get the Taliban. Sounds like a good plan. So we didn't end up getting Osama bin Laden for about 10 years. He was cornered in Tora Bora but we got distracted with Iraq, which we'll get to in a little bit, okay? So I just want you to understand that there were opportunities at the beginning of this conflict to have this conflict have ended in a way that we would have built a coalition government with the Taliban. Now the Taliban just has free reign, right, 20 years later. So, so we, we are not in a good position at this point. We invaded Iraq in March of 2003. So get, get, your, get, your, get your dates, okay? September 11, 2001. Now we're in March of 2003. This is when we invaded Iraq. We're gonna talk about this in a second. All the efforts that we had been doing, making in Afghanistan, now got completely ignored and all efforts turned to Iraq. And this is where Afghanistan was really 100% completely lost. You ask anybody that served in Afghanistan, they say, 2001, 2002, a little bit of 2003, we were making good gains. 2003, absolutely not our attention shift to Iraq. And we had no objective, right? Route Al-Qaeda, the evildoers, the people that hurt us on 9-11. Okay, well, we killed more than two-thirds of them. Time to get Osama bin Laden and go home, right? Mm -mm. No. Then we got into this idea of nation building, overthrowing the Taliban, which had been in control of so much of the country. Now this became our new effort in Afghanistan, and it went to hell because our focus was on uh, uh, Iraq. Understand that the Afghanistan war was fought mostly by contractors, privatized military firms, PMFs. Okay? Contractors were doing mo much of the work. This was called the Rumsfeld Doctrine a small footprint, try to privatize as much of the military service as we possibly can, get in and out quickly. If we have to go back, we'll do that, we'll go back. But try to do war on the cheap. Right? Well, okay, Heather, what's wrong with contractors? Nothing, they're fine. But understand, they don't have the same rules of engagement that our military personnel do. They don't have the same level of professionalism that our military personnel have. They're not under the same rules of the Geneva Conventions that our military is under, or other international law, okay? These are private companies for profit. They have stockholders, okay? So there's nothing wrong with contractors, but understand the motivation is very different, very different. We're gonna talk about this a little bit more. Uh, it, it, by 2006, Afghanistan was completely a kleptocracy. It was just owned by a small number of people who were able to extract all the wealth out of it. It was a completely corrupt country. 
Um, soldiers were selling all of their military supplies. We were sending them for cash. Most of the Afghan National Army uh, was addicted to drugs, including COP, which is a type of opiate that you chew. It's estimated that the $2 trillion spent in Afghanistan, you've heard this number a whole lot the past couple of days, right? $2 trillion in Afghanistan. It's estimated by people on the ground that a full one-third was lost just to bribery, loss, waste, theft, abuse. One of my friends who served in Afghanistan, he said, it, we, we referred to the Karzai government as vice. Vertically integrated criminal enterprise. That's all it was, okay? So for 14 years, 15 years, it's been vice. It's just a money-making operation for contractors, for Afghanis, while our people are paying for it and our people are getting hurt in time. So let's move to the Iraq War. No, 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 stay right there. No, 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 no. <laughs> This is what this is what happened in the Iraq War. This is why you know you guys weren't around. But this is what this is how this happened. There was immediately, immediately the neoconservatives in the White House shifted their focus to Iraq. Immediately after 9/11, I'm talking within 24, 48 hours, depending on who you listen to. The opportunity to remake the Middle East to have democracies flourish throughout this very troubled part of the world. It's, this was just too tempting for them to pass up. Afghanistan isn't really part of the Middle East. It's Central Asia, it's a little bit far away. We gotta get one in the middle of the Middle East. Iraq, sounds good. Okay, so immediately under torture, which we'll get to in a second, under torture, you had Afghanis start to say, yeah, 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 uh, uh, yeah, 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 uh, uh, Iraq was part of Al-Qaeda. Yeah, 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 whatever you, whatever you want to say. Okay, because you'll say anything under torture. And when I mean under torture, I mean injecting fluid in your arms so that you're super, super, super hydrated and then urinating on yourself because they don't let you go to the bathroom and you're shackled. And then they crank that temperature down to about 30 degrees. So you can lay in your own urine and freeze. This is the kind of torture I'm talking about, all right? Um, and so people started giving this type of information and then our intelligence services, as Dean Goforth talked about, started cherry picking information to build the case for Iraq. Iraq was now a part of the big network of global terrorism. So this started really in November of 2001, and then in January of 2002, we get the Axis of Evil speech. And I say this because everybody here over the age of 30 remembers this very well. This is when George Bush got up and gave his State of the Union address not long after 9-11 and said, there is an Axis of Evil. And we all went, wait, I, I remember Axis uh, from World War II. What do you, who's, who's the Axis of Evil? Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Well, that just sounds like three countries you pulled out of the hat. And in fact, they did, right? These three countries are responsible for all this terror that was occurring throughout the world. We needed to start at least with one. Iraq is number one. Secretary of State Colin Powell gave a speech to the UN February of 2003, okay? So we got September 11, 2001. Axis of Evil, January 2002, Colin Powell goes before the UN, 2003, and says, makes this grand argument, with all of this information, photographs, testimony, all kinds of stuff, right? That they had chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, they even had missile capability. They weren't building dirty bombs, they were gonna send ICBMs right here to America, in Iraq. Okay? And here's Colin Powell, Secretary of State. And now, now, he says, I, I, I was completely taken advantage of because I had an enormous amount of legitimacy with the American people and they used me. They used me for my legitimacy and my honesty. All the social capital I had built up with the American people over decades of service. Damn straight they used him. This is what happened. You're 
thinking to themselves, why didn't, why didn't anybody stand up and say, wait a minute, this sounds like bullshit. This just this does not sound right. Well, how does Iraq have nuclear missiles and we're just hearing about this now? Well, some people were saying stuff like this. Joe Wilson was a former diplomat and an investigative reporter, and he published, look, I, I went to Niger where they said they were buying yellow cake, Iraqis were buying yellow cake uranium to be able to make nuclear weapons. I went there, I talked to all these people, and they were like, yellow cake, that's stuff that I had for my birthday. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so he publishes this, right, publishes it. Dick Cheney, incensed, Vice President Dick Cheney, incensed, tells his advisor, Scooter Libby, leak to the press that Joe Wilson's wife is Valerie Plain, an undercover CIA agent. That'll teach you. That'll teach you. That could have gotten her killed. That could have gotten other CIA agents killed. That's treasonous behavior because you are so committed to your lie that you don't want anybody to challenge it. Do you understand what I'm saying to you guys? The mainstream media was so completely asleep at the wheel. Just completely asleep at the wheel. There was, there was, there was no challenge to Don Rumsfeld's ridiculous press conferences. Ridiculous. Insulting press conferences. None. You get into Iraq, it was immediately clear there was no weapons of mass destruction. We all waited, remember? We all waited for the big announcement. We found the missiles. We found the biological weapons. We found the chemical weapons. Those announcements never came. Everybody kept saying, well, where, where are they? Where are they? Oh, they're, they're here. We know they're here. Don't worry about it. We're going to find them. Months went by. Months went by, you guys. Remember, months went by. No revelations, right? So, oh, oh no, we, you know, we, were, we were talking about biological weapons. Human rights. Human rights. We're here, we're here to protect human rights. Saddam Hussein's a bad dude. Did we mention Saddam Hussein's a bad dude? Yeah, we want to build a new nation here. We want to bring democracy to the Middle East. The, the story changed. You never heard about weapons of mass destruction anymore. Because there weren't any. There never were any. You might even suggest that they knew there were, there were none, right? Okay. So, fine. We get there. There's no weapons of mass destruction. Now we're getting all kinds of crazy stories about human rights. Paul Bremer, Bush's man on the ground, immediately dissolves the Iraqi government when it's overthrown, gets rid of the, all the people who knew how to run the country, the members of the Ba'ath regime. All right, this is Saddam Hussein's political party. Saddam Hussein's on the run. He's hiding. Get rid of all the people that can run the government. All the people in the military immediately disbanded it. Okay, so everybody that was in power, everybody that knew what they were doing now no longer had a job. Oh, and by the way, a lot of these people had guns because they were the military of Iraq. Iraq is an ethnic country with three significant divisions. Sunnis, Shia, Kurds. Sunnis are a minority. That's who Saddam Hussein was, was a minority ethnic population. Shia were the majority. We don't know anything about any of this. A Muslim is a Muslim is a Muslim. I heard they're brown. That's it. We have an election in Iraq. We're so proud of ourselves. We're bringing democracy to Iraq. Well, the Shia are the majority, so they elected a Shia government. Well, now the Sunnis are like, oh, crap. Now we are going to be treated cruelly like we treated them for the past 60 years. This is the beginning of the insurgency. This is the beginning of the Iraq war, when it really took off. So you had the Sunni population, no jobs, all the weapons, all the training, now killing Shia and killing Americans, who they see as supporting Shia. What are the Kurds doing? Please leave us alone. Don't touch us. Don't talk to us. Just leave us alone. We're just sitting over here. Don't mess with us. These Sunni fighters ultimately banded with their Sunni fighters in Syria who wanted to overthrow their Shia leader, Bashir al-Assad. That's where ISIS came from. ISIL, ISIS, Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, or Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant. That's where that came from. Sunnis 
meeting in the middle between Syria and Iraq in forming this uh, horrid regime that killed an enormous number of people. Again, back to the contractors in Iraq. You've had a lot of privatized military firms. Again, I'm still wanting to uh, run the war on the cheap. But there are a couple that I want you to remember, and if you guys have to write papers for Craig Goforth or somebody, just do some research on Blackwater. Just do some research on Blackwater. This is a paramilitary organization run by Eric Prince. You guys heard of Betsy DeVos, the intellectual secretary of education that we had in the last administration. This is her brother, Eric Prince, ran Blackwater. It's, it's uh, based out of eastern North Carolina. They hire ex-military and will we'll rent them out to the highest bidder anywhere in the world. Doesn't necessarily need to meet American interests at all. Blackwater, um, because they did not follow military protocol, were involved in an, an enormous number of tragedies in Iraq, including uh, Nassur Square, which was a, a Blackwater uh, SUVs or driving through the square. A tire blew. They jump out, start shooting everybody. Civilians were killed right there in the middle of downtown Baghdad. Two Blackwater contractors were traveling through uh, central central Iraq. And they went through a city of Fallujah, which was a city that for years the American military had been working to create partnerships and relationships to keep that, it's a very large city, to keep it safe. These contractors went through, of course they get shot, killed. Those two years now are gone because our military had to go in and basically kill everybody in Fallujah. As this, this is the fault of Blackwater. They have no responsibility for any of this. Kellogg, Brown, and Root. This was a huge company that was a division of Halliburton, and Halliburton, their CEO was Vice President Dick Cheney. They got no bid contracts to rebuild Iraq. Money right in Dick Cheney's pocket. Okay, this is a money grab, guys. You're exactly correct. Uh, Cheney went on Meet the Press and said the administration would have to work in the shadows, applying that international law wasn't going to apply. Look at defense contractors are perfect for this. The big five, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop, Grumman, Raytheon, and uh, General Dynamics, are the big winners in the war on terror. Lockheed Martin made $75 billion in profit just in 2020. One company, one contractor, $75 billion. Do you know what the Department of State's budget is? That's the diplomats. Their budget for one year is only $44 billion. One of the top five contractors made $75 billion in this war on terror in one year. COVID didn't slow them down. Nah, don't need to take a break from killing in the pandemic. Uh, a set of legal memoranda came out, the torture memos. These were written by Assistant Attorney General John Yu. Uh, they advised the CIA and the Department of Defense and the President on the use of enhanced interrogation techniques. This is the torture I was talking about earlier. Prolonged sleep deprivation, binding in stress positions, waterboarding, that's where you hold a person down, strap something over their face, hold their mouth open, stick a towel in there and dump water so that it simulates drowning. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna tell them whatever. Right? If you're, if you're tortured in that way. He said this is going to be legally permissible because these guys are not prisoners of war. We don't have to worry about those designations, so we don't have to worry about international law. These guys are, uh, you know, something totally different. Enemy combatants. So we just created a new name, and then we created a no man's land of Guantanamo Bay where we could torture them at will. Now look at guys, we are better than this. We are way better than this. These international laws were made over decades to protect these things from happening, to stop these things from happening. This is why we have international law. This is why people bleed and sweat over these things. And to just totally dismiss them makes us com seem completely illegitimate. It does not surprise me that Muslims see us in the way that Dr. Malone X was talking about. It does not surprise me. 
when we do these horrible things, right, in the name of safety and security. Guantanamo Bay originally had 780 detainees. 780. 741 have been released because they were determined to just be, you know, people living their life. 40 still remain, but only two have been actually convicted of any crimes. We've been holding people for 20 years without even charging them. How is that in any way appropriate under any legal standards we have? Okay. Um, yeah, so we talked about Blackwater. Uh, we, every time these things happen, every time these things happen, um, we create more and more and more terrorists. So show the next slide, and I apologize, there's some graphic, graphic images here. This is Abu Ghraib. This was a prison under Saddam Hussein in Iraq where everybody knew that's where the bad ones went to be hung and tortured. And this became a prison run by the Americans once we overthrew Saddam Hussein. And we would take whoever somebody decided to accuse was a terrorist or was an insurgent, and we tortured them. American service personnel tortured them. This is called the Vietnam. A man is strapped to two wires on his fingertips and told that if he steps off the box, he'll be electrocuted and dies. And so that he's, he has to hold his, his hands like this for hours and hours and hours with uh, visual deprivation, nudity, lots of nudity. The reason why they did this is because in these cultures, uh, homosexuality is, is looked down upon like it, it, there's nothing worse than being a homosexual. And what they would say is, we're going to get you naked and pile you up with other men, and we're going to take pictures of you so you can never go home to your village. So you will always be ashamed. This is a woman holding him like a dog. That's a man who was murdered. People were murdered through torture, right? I show you these images because they were broadcast all around the world of our service members doing stuff like this. The service members were arrested and put in jail. The people who were supposed to be supervising them, none of them got in trouble. Dick Cheney didn't get in trouble. Don Rumsfeld, who said torture's okay, he never got in trouble. People on the ground got in trouble. Right? Tells you, tells you how much they respect the troops. Here's Guantanamo Bay. You can go to the next one. So they can see, you can see what this was like. Again, dehumanizing. Understand that when people talk about these people, they say, oh, they're the worst of the worst. Well, how do you know? If they're the worst of the worst, show me the evidence. Let me see it. Right? If, if these guys are bad guys, if, they, if, they, if these guys have planned terrorist attacks, well then you've got evidence, show it to me. You can block out anything that requires security you know, clearance, you can block it out. You can tell me what these guys did. They can't, so they don't. Look at, we, for years we were told, years, for 20 years we've been told, oh, we're making these gains in Afghanistan, oh, we're making these gains in Iraq. Anybody here serve in Iraq or Afghanistan? Okay. Who were these reports coming from? They were coming from bureaucrats, either in Fobbiton, forward operating bases, basically safe zones in Iraq or Afghanistan, or they were in Kabul in Afghanistan, or they were in the green zone in Baghdad. These are not people out in the field. People out in the field said, mm -mm, this is FUBAR. I'm not going to tell you that acronym. You'll have to figure that out for yourselves. This is FUBAR. This is never going to work out. But bureaucrats in these safe zones kept issuing reports that everything was okay. And of course the contractors are issuing reports that, hey, the Afghanistan army's being trained, and we're doing this, we're doing these maneuvers. Yeah, we saw how that worked out. They fell in less than 24 hours, right? Yeah, nobody's checking back on these. Okay? Drones. I could, I could spend five days on drones. Obama used drones 10 times as much as George W. Bush. So this isn't a Republican-Democrat thing, okay? It's not a Republican-Democrat thing. 
4,000 people were killed in the use of drones, and absolutely correct, you got civilian deaths, all right? You got a terrorist that's captured, well, let's kill his 14-year-old son. His 14-year-old son happens to be hanging out with other 14-year-olds in a cafe when that drone hits him, okay? The man that they killed, the father, was an American living in Lebanon, okay? All right. What does this mean to you? Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? Heather, this is old news. Okay, boomer. This just applies to y'all. Let me tell you how it affects you. Go ahead. Here's the cost, and I realize it's a ton of stuff, but it's a lot that you need to know. It's a lot that you need to know. 800, over 800,000 people have died due to direct violence in the war on terror. So take COVID and add another 150. That's direct violence. Many times more have died indirectly. Malnutrition, damaged infrastructure, environmental degradation. Look, your local CBS gets blown up and your mima can't go get her insulin. How long is she going to live? This is what happens in the war. Over 335,000 civilians, innocent people. Me, Michelle, Myrta, Frankie, Mark. Innocent people that had nothing to do with any of this. 335,000 civilians. 7,000 US soldiers have died and four times as many have committed suicide. PTSD is going to haunt us for the next 30 years, y'all because of mistakes, stupid mistakes. We're, we're not gonna know how many US service members were injured or ill while deployed, we'll never know. Contractors again, we don't know these numbers because they don't have to report them, but we got estimated approximately 8,000. 37 million people have been displaced, meaning they're not in their homes meaning they had to pack up their stuff sometimes in the middle of the night and get the hell out with nothing but the clothes on their backs. All because of 9-11 and mistakes our country made. I got more, I got more. <laughs> you don't think I got more, I got more. Climate change, Defense Department's one of the world's top greenhouse gas emitters. Erosions of civil liberties and human rights right here at home damaging our reputation worldwide. We got $2 trillion coming down the line in veterans care. So, you know, when we're talking about the $6.4 trillion that this has cost us, add another two. That's how much we're gonna be paying in veterans care over the next 20 years. Guys, if you wanna know why we can't have nice things, borrowed in all prior wars that this nation has gotten into I want to point out something very important they were paid for by the American people either through increase of taxes cutting to service programs here in America or bonds you bought bonds war bonds a mixture of those three things none of that happened during these wars in fact we got tax cuts where was the money borrowed China Japan we're going to be paying more on interest on these loans, eight and a half trillion dollars, than we're going to be paying for most of the social services we're going to be getting over the next 20 years. Okay? Yeah, lots of fun. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> the next one, it doesn't get any better. Look at this. Is, I have something I want you to think about. There's 1.3 million active duty personnel. That is less than one half of 1% of American people have served in these conflicts. Less than one half of 1%. So 99.5% had no skin in this game. And we had no money in this game because it's borrowed. So we didn't feel the effects. The American people weren't pounding on the election voting booth saying, I want an end to these wars because it didn't affect us. It will later. 
In the war on terror, U.S. leaders are essentially bankrolling these wars with debt that you guys are going to be paying. So you heard a little while ago, you're welcome. This is, why, this is why there's no conversation about your free college. This is why there's no conversation about greenhouse gases and trying to affect climate change. This is why we don't have high-speed rail. This is why we don't have child care. This is why we don't have the things that other developed democracies have, because we did this. We chose to spend six and a half trillion dollars on stupid wars in 85 countries. The next time a US president suggests attacking a country, I want you to do better than we did. Are you willing to go there? Are you willing to send someone you love there? If the answer is no, don't support it. If next time a president wants to go to war, are you willing to give up 10% of your paycheck? If the answer is no, don't support that war. Am I, am I making sense? Okay. If you can't find it on a map, don't go to war <laughs> with that country. Okay? Look at, uh, 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 you know, Grip, Grip got all uh, uh, fire and brimstone, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit. You put a Punisher sticker on your truck, you are not supporting the troops. You write a nasty post about Colin Kaepernick, you're not supporting the troops. By the way, Colin Kaepernick was advised to kneel by an army, by a Navy SEAL, who was a friend of his, who was another football player. So next time your dad talks about Colin Kaepernick, you tell him that. Navy SEAL told him to kneel. All right? That doesn't make you a patriot. This is what makes you a patriot. My country can do better. We are better than this. I am gonna do better from this point on. So don't be upset that we were critical. Don't be upset that we're critical. We're critical because we love. We know we can be better. We have rules that are good rules. There are people in this country that are good people. Please, I'm begging you, do not make these mistakes, because there will be another war. Please, 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 critically think. Make your representatives critically think. Thank you. Now, we're spending money in upholding a lot of 
terrible regimes all over the world, and I think those 85 countries are definitely examples of that. In the name of fighting terrorism. Good question. Yeah, Brett, you want to ask me yours? <laughs> How do you decrease the appeal of extremist ideology in some of these countries? I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. That's John's question. How do you um, reduce the level of extremism? I mean, that's the appeal of the appeal to it. Yeah, the appeal to extremism. You know, that was a lot of a big conversation with U.S. allies like Saudi Arabia afterwards, because Saudi Arabia, there's kind of a I mean, Salafi jihadism came from scholars and intellectuals like Kitab in Egypt, the uh, uh, Maldudi in Pakistan, and then you have in Saudi Arabia under the Wahhabi, a very strong Salafi state, but not just jihadist. So there was some reckoning there. They've gone through some reforms. There's talk, I mean, in, January, in February of uh, this year, Saudi Arabia went through some reform. They know recently in you know, women driving, things like this. But the thing is, Saudi Arabia, is, they're in a very difficult situation. The more reforms they open up in terms of loosening their social fabric, Create, can create uh, you know, re, um, backlash from um, extremist um, madrasas and everything else there. And if they don't, then there's tension between Western allies. So I, I don't know that answer. That is like one of the big questions in the world, like how do you reduce this poverty? Because that was going to be mentioned, right? Impoverished young Arab men, especially, who are idle are going to become, you know, um, wrapped up into that world. You know, and Osama bin Laden wrote in his letter to America in 2002 exactly why he was pissed off and exactly why he attacked America. And it was pretty basic stuff. Like, you're, you're in our holy lands, Mecca and Medina. You, we don't want you in Saudi Arabia. We don't want you coming into our countries and telling us what to do and exporting your values and your ideals. Okay, like that, uh, I, I can live with that. <laughs> I take a little bit of different, I take a bit of a different angle on that. There, I look at those as like exacerbations and, because when I study ideology, at least what I did with like the Japanese, I, and looking at the Cold War with the Soviet Union, I'm starting to think, well, when people start, the leaders start talking about ideology, it's a tendency that you may want to start believing what they're saying and how they believe. Typically, they really, the evidence suggests they really do believe as deeply and deep-seated in some of their convictions. And I always wonder, really, what, I'm not a big fan of blowback assumptions in history, like there were these things that then created the radicals that then responded. For example, some people respond to, say, in 1924, the Immigration Act, which was ridiculous toward the Japanese, and things like that led to Pearl Harbor. They exacerbated, they, I don't know if they created, with like um, the U.S. not some policy in Saudi Arabia, would, have, would it have necessarily de-radicalized Al-Qaeda? Would they not have acted in, what, in the way they did? I think their convictions were so strong about a global jihad, I still think they are, but I'm not sure. You know, certainly, you don't want to create tensions and exacerbate things, and the U.S. has been, I think, more sensitive about that. Don't bring soldiers near Muslim holy sites. That's not a smart thing to do. But when it comes to extremism and leaders that are charismatic like bin Laden and Hitler, good God, when they are persuasive about these, their convictions, they're very powerful and they're very deep-seated in the way they express these things, and it has an effect that's beyond any kind of how the British did this, or the French did that, or the Americans did that, sort of thing. They said, then that's just my take on ideology and deep-seated convictions. Good. Others? Sierra? You talked a little bit about um, how Iraq shifted from a war, of, or how the Iraq war started, and it was that shift from bio, uh, biological weapons to uh, democracy. Um, and I mean, we've had discussions, obviously, but for the other three on the panel, how would you address the aftermath of the human security issue that we have created over the last 20 years? How long you got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I don't have an answer. That, 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 that's, that's, that's a dissertation on steroids. Uh, I, I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't have an answer. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. What are you meaning by human security issues? So, um, such as the scenes like in the Kabul airport where the women are handing their children over to American soldiers to get them out of the country. Um, for the women and the teenage girls with the Taliban taking back over, they're not going to have education anymore. Um, that's a human security issue in my opinion and I don't know, um, what I'm asking is basically is there anything that the U.S. can do other than obviously going back and invading again um, to fix what we have to cause. My, my short answer would be this. Can, can America be the world's policeman? Now, with Dr. Hong just shows we're, we're all over the place trying to tell everybody, else, well, can, can we go in and do this? The short answer is no. Scott, the U.S., I mean, we've lost track a little bit here of multilateralism, the need to work through many countries maybe not necessarily the UN, but at least with a lot of the aid agencies in European countries. The US, I mean, this unilateralism is often a power plus a sense of exceptionalism. The idea of, you know, you can do it in the world often leads to unilateralism. And it's, you're going down a scary path if that's always the frame. I mean, I understand self-defense. The, the US means self-defense goes back three centuries. So initially, the right to self-defense in Afghanistan, of course, and that's why you saw the numbers you saw in Congress. But then the trouble after that, the, the diversion to Iraq. Um, but once you get into unilateralism in terms of it could be a rocky road. Yeah, we, we have a very paternalistic attitude towards people in other parts of the world as if we know best, what's best for them. And um, I think that's what's gotten us into a lot of these problems. Like, oh, we're going to overthrow Saddam Hussein. We're going to bring you all these things. What was that? The helicopter. That's the sound of freedom coming. You know, the idea. It's, it's the old white man's burden. You know, the idea that we should control colonies and we should tell other people what to do. And at the end of the day, yeah, we we definitely have created an enormous mess in Afghanistan. But it's up to the Afghani people to make those choices. And people are going to suffer, and people suffer all around the world. But at the end of the day, we can't just be going everywhere and fixing everything. I think we have to have a change of mindset that, the, that does the world even need fixing? You know, like people need to do some of these things for themselves and I can trust other people to make these decisions. And hey, it may not be a country that I want to live in. These may not be rules I would accept, but that's me, right? I, I, Yes, I saw the pictures of Kabul, and they're awful, and they're scary, and they're terrible, but understand Kabul is a country of, uh, Kabul is a city of about 100,000 people, and there's millions of people in Afghanistan, and for the vast majority of them, their life was not different under U.S. occupation of Kabul. It was better for women in Kabul, but outside in the rural areas, nothing changed. I was listening to a soldier and given an interview, and he said, I literally had to take weeks to explain to some of these villagers that I was not Russian because they didn't know the difference between Russians and Americans because that's how many times they've been invaded. So if people outside of, you know, Kandahar and Kabul didn't experience any positive effects, and that's the vast majority of people in the country, right? If they want something different, they will need to do that themselves. I, 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 don't, I don't think I am in any position to tell anybody else in the world how I have a question for you. If say we say we do that, we want to go there and, and solve this. The next war, the women are going to be are, are going to be uh, drafted, just like my my grandsons. You ready? Yeah. I'm just I'm just saying because I, I bet if, if we keep sending people, we're going to have to draft again, and, and there's no reason in the world why you ladies can't go with my with my grandsons. I, I'm just, I'm just saying. I completely agree with you, but my viewpoint on that is that there shouldn't have to be a draft. We shouldn't be, not not saying that the draft right now shouldn't be a thing, but we shouldn't have to force people to fight a war they don't want to fight. Mm -hmm. You mean like Vietnam? Mm -hmm. You mean like Korea? Mm -hmm. you mean like World War One and Two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, it, if it's not worth it, like I said, you, you use my little two-part analysis. If you're not willing to go serve yourself, then that's not a war you should support. If you're not willing to give up 10% of your income, that's not a word you should support, period. 
Don't be sending other people to do stuff. Don't be uh, spending borrowed money. I know that's the way Sierra feels. You know, it's, if it's if it's not a, a war worthy of, of your investment, then it's not a war worthy of having. I'm just saying, if, if there is another large action, a draft is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And who's and listen, I'm I'm just talking. We're, we're, we're good. I'm just discussing. I'm like I'm not being mean to you. I'm just it's just how I teach. We're, you're gonna have to go. Okay. I'm too old to go. I'll I'll clap for you as you go. Although he's probably packing right now. Well, I'm definitely armed. <laughs> Mark, I love you though. She's the my best. response She's the best. is that, uh, and this may be, not be exactly right on with what you're said, talking about with the, in the uh, couple of our airport, but uh, the United States has had ever since the Puritans this idea that we are a city on a hill. We have this American exceptionalism. We can do no wrong. Our rules can be easily broken because we're, we're Americans. And so that's caused, as you've heard, person after person after person say, that's caused so many mistakes from hubris. And it's, it's, it's come back and bitten us into you know where, and it's gonna to continue to do that. And so I, I think that if we can just start, if, if the Christians could just make a simple shift, to start seeing non-US people as people. Or, we don't need to worry about the Christian-Muslim divide at all if everybody just becomes an atheist. Just throwing that <laughs> I, I, I don't agree with that, I'm just letting you know. I, I, do. I, I don't agree with that, I'm I just saying. Do. I'm, I'm looking for, I'm with it. But as a Catholic, I'm not sure what he means by Christian. I'm not sure what he means by Back in 1976, when I was a senior here, I wanted to camping trip around the world. And I stood right here and talked about it after I came back. But it was during, it was mostly Muslim countries. And it was during the month of Ramadan. And in the month of Ramadan, Muslims had to fast and they get, kind of get oriented at the very end of the day. But in every country I went to, my money was no good. Uh, the, uh, the hospitality was unbelievable. Uh, I made so many friends. I still wrote to them for years and years. And just to have that kind of experience is to you know, and not be the ugly American or the proud American, but just a friend. And, and that was so helpful for me. And that's the, the kind of the basis of what I'm trying to say is, you know, don't be a don't be a dick. It's <laughs> <laughs> right. good life advice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the basis of every religion. Something just related to what you said. I, I don't believe in cultural imposition and certainly things like nation building. I worked in certain places like Japan because the conditions were in place for that to, to happen. But um, I would say, I'm somewhat of a fan of the Enlightenment, that you know, in such a diverse world of 7.5 7 billion people, that ideals of secularism, in a very pluralistic, diverse world, respect and tolerance for minorities, I think that would go really far in a world of today. So in that way, I'm not for cultural, cultural imposition, but certainly for advertising it. I just wanted to say that I really love being back in person and hanging out with mm -hmm. wonderful colleagues and being smart and sharing. Thank you guys so much for coming. I really appreciate your patience and good questions. And if you have any more and you want to come down and talk to us, please feel free to do okay. that. But thank you guys so much. Thank you all.